A lot of people have said that the appeal of sports is that it showcases the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat. It is a grand baroque display of the highest of highs and the lowest of lows of the human condition. Sure, you could experience the same thing in a good movie or TV show, but the realm of sports has one big thing going for it. It's real. None of it is scripted. There's no one pulling the strings to make things happen. These are real people and real stories playing out in real time right in front of your very eyes. Therefore, the entire draw of sports relies on its legitimacy. It's one of the few meritocracies we still have left. More and more, the highest institutions of our society are headed by people who are not the best suited for the task, but are the most well-connected. When you enter the workforce for the first time in your late teens or early 20s, you learn very quickly that what you know doesn't matter nearly as much as who you know. Even you watching this right now probably have a boss who got where they are because of brown nosing, nepotism, or just plain favoritism. Every part of our lives are becoming increasingly less and less merit-based, except sports. There, you get on the team because you are the best. Not because your dad was friends with the coach, not because you went to the right fraternity or went out to the right parties, but you were the best. Maybe not the best period, but you were the best the team could afford or the best at a specific play style that team utilizes. Either way, you were the best at something. Some way or another, you earned your spot. And the sanctioning bodies have to be legitimate as well to make sure all the rules are enforced fairly and evenly. They do that by building this, a dam of legitimacy. They call balls and strikes nothing more. No matter what, they will not put their thumb on the scales, only the players in the game will. And the rules will make sense and be enforced as fairly as humanly possible. Mistakes will be made, but not out of any malice or any ill intent. Like a regular dam, it takes a long time to build. It might take years or even decades to get all the kinks worked out, but once put in place, if properly maintained, it will last well beyond the time when we're all dead. And that's the kicker. A dam is a strong and imposing structure, impervious to all but the most serious of attacks. But something as small as a hairline crack, if left unattended, can grow and split the dam wide open given enough time. In the NFL on September 10th, 1978, the Oakland Raiders were playing the San Diego Chargers. And on a drive nearing the end zone, the Chargers utilized the shorter field and dialed up a blitz. Scrambling Raiders quarterback Ken Stabler was immediately swarmed by white jerseys. As he was wrapped up, he fumbled the ball on purpose by just tossing it forward while he was being sacked to give his team one last chance at making the score. Since he was not yet down, the ball was live, and while players threw themselves at the free ball, it kept getting moved further and further downfield until a Raider secured it in the end zone. Six points for Oakland. The play dubbed the Holy Roller was very quickly derided by everyone who wasn't a Raiders fan. Now any quarterback who was in danger of being sacked could just roll the ball forward and hope for the best. The play was immediately legislated out of existence, and now if an offensive team recovers a fumble forward of the line of scrimmage, the ball is moved back to the spot of the previous play. Something similar happened in 2002 with the infamous tuck rule that, oddly enough, caused the Raiders to be eliminated from the playoffs. What goes around comes around, I guess. After the game, fans voiced their displeasure with the rule and the NFL quickly scrapped it. In 2007, it was discovered that NBA referee Tim Donaghy was betting on games that he himself was officiating, sometimes putting his finger on the scale in playoff games that had championship implications, calling fouls that were iffy at best and getting star players benched. When he was arrested by the FBI for his ties with the mob, the NBA cracked down on its regulations and practices for referees and put more safeguards in place. These blows to the dams of the NFL and the NBA cracked their facades but were patched up quickly enough so that their legitimacy was never too seriously questioned afterwards. Bad calls still get made, but overall their dams hold. A sports dam of legitimacy breaking is extremely rare. But we do have one case here in America, a dam failure so cataclysmic that the story of its downfall gets more attention than the actual sport itself nowadays. This is NASCAR's dam of legitimacy, and it busted open a long time ago. When a dam fails, oftentimes it's from so many different causes that finding the main one is hard to determine. But with NASCAR, we can point to a specific person at a specific time, September 21st, 2003. That was when Brian France presided over his very first race as NASCAR's CEO, taking the reins over from his father, Bill France Jr., who had taken over for his father, Bill France Sr., making Brian France the third generation CEO of NASCAR. Brian's first act as CEO was actually a really good one. He eliminated racing back to the yellow flag. Previously, if a caution for an accident or an unsafe track conditions was thrown, then cars on the track would be scored as they came back to take the yellow flag at the start-finish line. Typically, there was a gentleman's agreement not to pass each other when coming to the line, but as years went by, guys kept pushing the envelope. 
After all, seeing a bunch of slowing cars that can be passed for position can be a really tempting thing to see just dangling out in front of you. This problem reached ahead one week prior to the Dover race at Loudoun on September 14th, when Dale Jarrett had an accident right at the start-finish line and was unable to get his car restarted, and he had to just sit there in the middle of the track helplessly watching cars scream by at full speed. NASCAR had been using electronic timing and scoring for 10 years up to that point, so it didn't take much to just freeze the field at the moment of caution and instruct drivers to immediately slow down as soon as they saw yellow lights. Again, this was a great decision, and coming two years after the death of Dale Hurt Sr., I honestly can't believe they didn't do it sooner. Brian seemed at first to be a young but steady hand to guide NASCAR through the 21st century. He had managed short tracks out west well before taking the step up to NASCAR CEO, so he knew all too well the clashes that tend to break out between drivers and promoters. Drivers are hyper-competitive and will sniff out any advantage they can get and will ask for forgiveness rather than asking for permission. Promoters and the CEO of NASCAR are there to make sure the playing field is as level as possible, enforce the rules evenly, not show favoritism, expand the brand, make money, and maintain that dam of legitimacy we talked about earlier. It's a tough job and a very tricky tightrope to walk, but Brian France seemed up to the task at first. Then came 2004. This was a pivotal moment for NASCAR, still riding a TV rating surge that had been exponentially rising since the 70s. They changed the title sponsor from Winston to Nextel, a wireless telecom company that would later merge with Sprint. Winston, a cigarette company, wasn't allowed to advertise in the U.S. anymore, but the government had allowed their contract with NASCAR to run its course through the end of 2003. Nextel ushered in a slew of new looks and colors to the sport, and one that came with it was purely of Brian France's creation, the Nextel Chase for the Cup. In 2003, Matt Kenseth had led the point standings pretty much from wire to wire and locked up the championship with a race remaining on the schedule, meaning that he didn't even have to show up to the last race of the season to still walk away with the cup. His points lead was just that monumental. So Brian France proposed and eventually won out on the chase. Now with 10 races to go, the top 10 in points would be locked into a sort of pseudo-playoff bracket, where the regular season points would be reset, and the leader at the playoff break would be given 5 points above second, and second place would be given 5 points above third, and so on. This was controversial to say the least when it was announced. It was clear that after a dominant season like what Matt Kenseth had pulled off, NASCAR wanted a closer points finish to drum up interest in the final 10 races, as traditionally that's when ratings started to downturn due to the NFL season starting and just plain burnout after nearly 30 weeks of competition. But Brian and NASCAR wagered that this new playoff format would keep more people engaged. However, they failed to see something basic. NASCAR fans saw the championship more as a bonus feature than the main draw. It was an interesting storyline to keep up with as it unfolded across the 36 weeks of competition, but the main draw were the individual races, they always had been. The championship was still revered to be sure, but the rank and file NASCAR fans were more concerned about how their favorite drivers did each week and about going to the next event at their home track. A playoff format for the final 10 races was seen more as a gimmick than anything. And worse, it wasn't even necessary. The 2002 points battle had gone right down to the wire with a late season four-way slugfest. 1997, 96, 95 all had tight margins and went to the very last race as well. Playoffs weren't just goofy, they were completely unneeded. But turning the format to determine your year-end champion into an arbitrary, contrived, gimmicky playoff dog and pony show was the first crack in NASCAR's dam of legitimacy. It would be far from the last. In the short term, however, ratings were up for 2004, and that would continue in 2005. Little did anybody know it at the time, but that was NASCAR's peak in popularity. It would be all downhill from there. But another issue had emerged around this time that was quickly noticed by the NASCAR nation, the Phantom Debris Caution. Through the 90s, NASCAR had one caution for debris on the track every other race, which is perfectly understandable. Sometimes stuff flies out onto the track, and it poses a serious, potentially life-threatening danger when cars are zipping around out there in excess of 200 miles an hour. But in 2004, the number of debris cautions rocketed up to one and a half per race. And then in 2005, it went all the way up to two and a half per race. And to make matters worse, TV crews would never even show the debris. The commentators would just say debris in turn two, but evidence of it would never be captured on camera. This is particularly egregious because when a caution is thrown, the field is bunched back up, eliminating whatever cushion the leader had built up over the last hundred laps or so. Throughout the 2000s, phantom debris cautions became so blatant that even my normally stoic grandparents were calling it out as bogus cautions. They would say, yep, went green for too long, gotta bunch them back up. And this was the next big blow to the dam. NASCAR was no longer content with manipulating the championship for ratings, they were now manipulating individual races. 
Remember, that's the thing NASCAR fans care the most about. As demand for seats at NASCAR races continued to grow and ticket prices soared, it became easier and easier to just say, no thanks, and stay at home. And as NASCAR continued to put their whole hand on the scales blatantly in full view of everyone, it became even easier to find something else to watch on Sunday. So why was Brian France allowed to do this? Was there no one there to tell him no? Did he not have any advisors? What was the deal here? Well, it all goes back to how NASCAR was founded and ran since its inception. From the beginning, NASCAR has been operated as a family business with the France family firmly at the helm of the ship. Whatever Big Bill France Sr. said back in the day was what got done. No questions asked. It was basically a little mini dictatorship, like most businesses. When a driver's union was formed in the early 60s, Bill France openly said he would not allow unionized drivers to compete at his tracks, and even threatened to use a pistol to enforce that rule. He eventually banned Curtis Turner and Tim Flock, his two most popular drivers, over the disagreement. And when another union gave him grief in 1969 over safety concerns at his new track Talladega, he caused a falling out amongst the drivers that led to a walkout. And he hand waved the rules away and let smaller, slower cars start the race instead. His son Bill France Jr. ran NASCAR with a similar iron fist and had clashes with the Allisons and Darrell Waltrip. Probably his worst call as CEO was allowing Richard Petty's 1983 win at Charlotte to stand even when Petty's engine was several cubic inches too big and he had installed illegal tires onto his car. Bill France Jr. did so because this was Petty's 199th win and he was one win away from 200 and that would make for national headlines. Bill France Jr. loved the prospect of a good story and would ignore rules if that many could grow NASCAR's brand. With a history like this, was it really that surprising that Brian France was given the reins to do whatever he pleased with NASCAR? It was practically a family tradition at this point. But there were drivers who spoke up about the dam bursting. When Tony Stewart pointed out the bogus debris cautions and NASCAR was basically playing God, he got fined $100,000 for quote, actions detrimental to stock car racing. The same rule cited to ban drivers who unionized back in the 60s. And finding drivers that spoke out became a recurring theme throughout the 2000s and 2010s. In 2013, when a new car was introduced, Denny Hamlin was fined for saying, and I'm paraphrasing here, the car isn't where it needs to be, but we'll get there eventually. We'll work it out. Now, even the most mild criticism was hunted down with prejudice and ratings continued to tank. NASCAR could no longer blame the 2008 recession for its dwindling crowds and TV ratings. By 2012, other sports had come out on the other end of the economic downturn and it was clear that there was something else at work here. Remember the chase from 2004? Well, it continuously went through rework after rework. It was expanded out to 12 drivers, there was a wild card slot, and even the point system in its entirety was restructured. But in 2013, the wheels of the chase completely fell off with Spengate. I've talked about this a number of times on this channel, but suffice it to say, at the last race before the playoffs began, Clint Boyer intentionally spun himself out to cause a caution so the field would be bunched back up and give his teammate Martin Truex a better shot at sneaking his way into the top 12. To add fuel to the fire, Brian Vickers, Truex's other teammate, pitted coming to take the green to give Truex just one more spot to help him out. When NASCAR heard the radio traffic between the teams that confirmed that this was planned, they ousted Truex from the chase, fined the teams for record-setting amounts of money, and put the 13th driver in the standings, Jeff Gordon, into the chase to take Truex's spot. However, there was no rule on the books to stop drivers from manipulating races to game the playoff system. Plus, NASCAR itself had been manipulating races for a decade up to this point, so the penalty was completely arbitrary. Yet another crack in the dam. The next year, NASCAR would change the chase again with the current playoff format we have today, with a 16-man elimination-style bracket for the final 10 races. The last race of the year would be a winner-take-all race. Of the final four championship-eligible drivers in that race, the highest finisher would be the champion. Now the championship format was a total crapshoot. A good first 26 races would be all for none if you just had one or two DNFs in the final 10 races. It was clear what NASCAR wanted, a Game 7 moment, a race for all the marbles at the end of the year that would draw in big crowds, but that never happened. To this day, year-end ratings are still declining. They never saw an uptick. The playoffs would create a watershed moment for NASCAR in 2015, just one year after its creation. Matt Kenseth, the man who won the 2003 championship in dominating fashion that created the trigger for this whole series of events, is having a great season. He's the odds-on favorite to win the cup at season's end. But at Kansas, another driver who has already advanced the next round of the playoffs is right behind him, Joey Logano. Knowing that taking the win from Kenseth would bolster his chances at winning the cup, Joey went full send on Kenseth and wrecked him going into turn one. Well, this is clearly championship manipulation, right? It's clear what Joey did, but no. 
The win stands and Brian France himself says in an interview that he thinks what Joey did was a smart move to deny Kenseth the win. That sounds an awful lot like favoritism from the CEO of the sport. If the dam was leaking water before, it's gushing out of a gaping hole now. A few races later, after Kenseth was eliminated from the playoffs, he would take an opportunity to make sure Joey wouldn't win the title, same as Joey did to him. He wrecks Joey at Martinsville, effectively making sure that they both would end up without a championship. For this, Matt Kenseth was suspended for two races while Joey was allowed to continue to compete. Wait, what? Kenseth gets a penalty for Martinsville, but Joey doesn't get one for Kansas? That doesn't even make sense. Plus, that same year in the playoffs, Kevin Harvick caused a caution coming to take the green flag at the end of a race at Talladega. Because his car had some sort of mechanical issue, he was unable to maintain race speed. So he causes a wreck on purpose, and that yellow would be the end of the race, and he'd limp into the next round of the playoffs. So wait, Spingate was race manipulation, but this wasn't? What gives? NASCAR can't even enforce their own rules anymore because they're so murky and poorly understood that there isn't any way to enforce them even if they wanted to. Playoffs work in other sports because they're one-on-one -on -one events. One team wins and the other loses. The only way to advance is to win. But in NASCAR, there are 40 competitors. In order to advance, you don't have to win, you just have to finish better than the bottom four in the standings. This means you could cause a caution, spin a guy out intentionally, or do any number of other things on purpose or by accident to game the system and get the end result you want. By design, the playoffs create silly bullshit like this. The races are manipulated by the sanctioning body, the way we crown a champion is a contrived gimmicked mess, and sometimes we have both of these things rear their head in the same night. At the final race at Homestead in 2016 with 25 to go, Carl Edwards makes a pass on fellow Final Four driver Kyle Busch to take the second spot. Kyle Larson is the leader and about three seconds ahead of Carl, but he's not in the Final Four, so Carl would be the champion so long as nothing stupid happens. And then something stupid happened. With 15 to go, a caution was thrown for Dylan Lupton, who had blown a left rear tire going down the backstretch. But to his credit, he immediately pulled to the apron and didn't get debris on the racing surface. But NASCAR, seeing an opportunity to create one of those Game 7 moments, threw the caution anyway to bunch the field back up. When the race was resumed, the inevitable happened. The restart zone. Kyle Larson, the outside. Carl Edwards on the inside. Green flag back in the air. They're blocking. Good going. Big hits by the 19, and the caution comes back out again. Carl Edwards and Joey Logano, both going for a cup, wrecked each other and about half the field in an embarrassingly stupid restart. Jimmy Johnson, who had just barely limped into the Final Four with an average finish of 14, claimed the cup pretty much by default from there. Carl Edwards got out of his car, marched over to Joey Logano's crew, shook their hands, and basically retired on the spot. He simply could not take the BS anymore. Ladies and gentlemen, leave your homes and retreat to higher ground because the dam has officially failed. It's not just the fans aren't watching anymore, the drivers don't want to drive anymore. Because to anybody paying attention, it is clear that this is no longer a legitimate sport. There is far too much interference from the sanctioning body to claim that. NASCAR is trying to manufacture entertainment instead of letting the sport play out naturally. And to add to all of this, in the last 15 years or so, pay drivers have become increasingly more common. Newer guys will come up through the ranks quickly and their parents are either millionaires or they have connections with sponsors who will bankroll them. And teams looking for any monetary edge they can get will sign these drivers, not because they've proven that they're the best by working their way up the rungs of the ladder system, but because they bring home the bacon to fund the rest of the organization. Some of these drivers are pretty good, some are mediocre, and they're taking up more and more seats with each passing year. And now I have to ask myself the question, are we actually watching the best stock car drivers in the country or just the ones with the deepest pockets? I don't know anymore. And yes, pay drivers exist in Formula 1 and other series, but they don't have all these other problems threatening the integrity of their dams, so they're able to manage. But NASCAR, in the ultimate admission that they had been manufacturing debris cautions all along, in 2017 they announced they would have stage cautions. At predetermined points of a race, they would throw the yellow flag and halt the race just so they could bunch the field back up. And wouldn't you know it, debris cautions magically went away after that. NASCAR was still throwing the same number of cautions per race, but now instead of phantom debris cautions, it was a predetermined yellow. What the hell is going on here? Are the people running this sport high on drugs or something? In August of 2018, Brian France was arrested for DUI. While being arrested, he played the usual cards you'd expect. Do you know who I am? I'm friends with the president, etc, etc. Turned out the guy making all of those questionable decisions for NASCAR was on the sauce this whole time. 
I wish I could say it was all him and his substance abuse problems, but that would be a lie. Jim France, his uncle, took over as CEO and continued all the same bad policies his nephew had put in place. The ship never deviated from its course. In 2021 at the Daytona Road Course race, Chase Elliott was pretty much running away with the win. This was in the middle of his road course domination streak, and he was showing all those other wins were not flukes. He was putting on a clinic out there. But then in the closing laps, rain was called in the eastern end of the track. Turned out it was just a few rogue drops, not any serious amount of rain. But NASCAR jumped at the opportunity to bunch the field back up, and Chase Elliott ended up losing the race. Now not even the golden boy was safe from NASCAR's meddling because it happened to him again at the Roval in 2022. A few bad calls every once in a while are going to happen, but Jesus, this is nearly an every other race affair now. You scroll down through the comments on any NASCAR video about the good old days, and you will find people saying that they stopped watching, and by far and away the biggest reason they give is something along the lines of, I just can't take NASCAR's BS anymore. NASCAR for a long time thought they could pull the wool over our eyes and piss down our backs and tell us it was raining, but after two decades of this, people have overwhelmingly just left the sport. There were a lot of factors at play, but I think this is the number one reason by far. A lack of legitimacy. Now I know there are some people, mostly fans on the younger side, who like the playoffs and are probably down in the comments telling me to get over it, or if you don't like it then don't watch. But that's the problem. People aren't watching anymore. Millions of people have pointed out the problem and you told them to walk away and they did. I'm not hating on NASCAR in the playoffs, I'm merely pointing out that these things are massive problems. And we need to course correct sooner rather than later or else there will not be a NASCAR here in 20 years. Even the playoff loyalists had to admit that the Truck Series finale in 2023 was a complete shit show, with Final Four drivers spinning each other out and hunting one another down. And the playoffs intentionally foster this kind of mindless carnage. They were made to make things more exciting, but they just make them embarrassing. And they will continue to do so for as long as they are in place. There's a reason why all these attempts at quote unquote entertainment haven't worked at all to stop the bleeding of TV ratings and popularity. I've seen some people say that the playoffs can be changed, we just gotta change this, tweak that, and then it'll work out. But seeing people argue about that is like watching two people argue about whether or not a house should be built out of wood or brick, and I'm trying to tell you that the house has a foundation built on quicksand. It doesn't matter what you use, it's not going to work. I am as far from a hater of NASCAR as you will find. At age 17, I bought a NASCAR license with every intention of competing in the weekly racing series at Greenville Pick and Speedway, only a blown motor dashed my hopes of that. I have poured my heart and soul and thousands of dollars into this sport, and I'll probably continue to do so, because I believe that at its core it still produces a good product, if left to its own devices. I just want the sanctioning body to stop interfering every chance they get. And that's the thing, it's so easy to fix. NASCAR just needs to do nothing. Let the races run their course, and don't gimmick the hell out of the point system. But the problem is, I don't see that happening because NASCAR has had their thumbs in the pie for so long that they can't imagine a world where they take them out. NASCAR has never been known for admitting that they were wrong. At every turn, they double and triple down on their bad decisions instead of just taking the L and admitting that something didn't work. If there is one thing that has always threatened to kill NASCAR right from day one, it was the massive egos of the people in charge. And through its nepotistic command structure, that is unlikely to go away and the dam will most likely not be rebuilt any time in the foreseeable future.